excuse me, in 1 Peter chapter 5, I'm going to begin reading at verse 5, where it says, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by, G by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now there's obviously a great deal here, and much of this is familiar to, to many of you. But back in verse 5, it starts out telling us that our attitude is to be one of subjection, not trying to be on, in charge, but to be willing to submit and submit to others and submit to uh, the accountability that comes from having folks around us who know what's going on with us. I'm just waiting for the cheering to die down. We always... Every time I mention accountability, the place just erupts, and it's, it's awesome. But, you know, sometimes uh, we, we like to keep to ourselves because it keeps us from being in that accountable position. But there is some value in saying, I care enough to expose myself to that accountability. What a tension. Well... That's okay, we're not going to spend the morning on accountability, but that's where it starts. That's submitting, an attitude of submitting. <coughs> and he says, be clothed, or put on as your clothing, wear like a garment, humility. Because God resists the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. When we set ourselves up in a position of pride or arrogance, we have put ourselves in a place where we're going to lose every time. Now, pride and arrogance are kind of ugly words, and most of us would like to say, well, pride, arrogance, I don't think they really describe me, but there's a lot of subtle ways that we move towards pride and arrogance. They don't look like what... Are you still here? You know, if, if I was to walk into your fourth grade homeroom and ask you who was arrogant in there, you might point to two or three people that you thought kind of displayed an attitude of arrogance. But if we got into subtler ways, we discovered that pretty nearly everybody in there was carrying some arrogance. There's just a few of them that we identify because of their behavior, because of the way they carry themselves and present themselves as, as having that. So the point here isn't, well, we're all arrogant, just relax. No, the point is we've got stuff to deal with. And just because you don't think of yourself as a prideful person doesn't mean you might even be prideful about that. <laughs> Hallelujah, anyhow. And pride is a great enemy. And humility is a great thing. God gives grace to the humble. I, I've been looking at just lists of verses in the Old Testament where it talks about God's relationship with the humble and God's relationship with a broken and contrite heart and God's relationship with those who are not exalting themselves. And, and we, we could just spend from now till the sun sets just reading the verses one after another that connect God to people in that position. And yet there's something about the way that people are that, that wants us to put me forward, put me up, put me, I need to be, I need to be. Are you guys still here? Likes that attention, likes that recognition, wants to be singled out and, and put forward as somehow superior or advanced. I'll take you back to your fourth grade homeroom again. You know, if, if, if there was ever anything that represented advanced, I, I remember <coughs> they put us in reading groups, and they called them by colors, I think, red, yellow, blue, something like that. But we knew, we knew what that meant. That was code for good readers, okay readers, problem readers. And you wanted to be in some other group. Not because you love that color, but because it represented some type of recognition for advancement. Put me over there where the cool people are. Are you guys still here? Yeah. Something about us which, which just says, I want to be not necessarily always noticed, because not everybody likes that type of attention, but I want to be superior. 
God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. He shows favor, pours out blessing, gives supernatural ability to the humble. That's an important thing. I wouldn't even want to think about facing life without his grace. And he gives it in abundance to the humble. Now, <coughs> humility, we recognize the word, we, 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 we hear it, and we say, yeah, humility, got it. But we need to ask ourselves, and I'm not talking about this morning, I'm talking about every day of your life. What does humility mean to me today? Humility isn't denying what God has done or said about us. Humility isn't knocking down everything that could possibly be positive just because it could be positive. But humility is having an awareness of just how short I come. In fact, I believe it was Charles Ryrie who offered this definition. Humility is an attitude of mind that realizes that one is without any reason for distinction in God's sight. Now you have distinction, but you haven't got a reason for it. And the minute that I think that I should be the apple of his eye, there's a problem. <laughs> Are we still getting that? Humility. The ability to, to know what the limitations of my abilities are and to rely on his. I think, you know, I was just reflecting the past eight or nine years with grandchildren coming on the scene, there have been babies around the house again. And one of the things you notice when you've got babies and then toddlers and then little kids is that they always seem to have a kind of an inflated idea of what they're capable of. They'll just grab onto stuff that they clearly are not going to be able to lift and try to lift it. They will attempt amazing feats of, of physical skill, which they do not have, fearlessly attempting things that nobody with any sense would be doing. Are you guys still out here? And I wonder sometimes if that's a little bit what it looks like if you were God. <laughs> just watching all these folks who think they've got it so together, think they've got everybody fooled, think that they've got their cool on, and they're just, hey, watch this, and it's like, oh, there they go again. Come on. Anybody can see that you're not going to be able. Are you guys still here? And you're thinking, well, you know, I thought I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can't do much. And we've got to, there's, a, there's a fine line between having utmost confidence in God and what he can do, even through me, and beginning to have confidence in me because I think I've got something going on. And most of us spend a little bit of time moving back and forth across that line. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. You know, in, in Matthew chapter 5, as Jesus is, is uh, entering into this long teaching here, he has a bunch of powerful things to say about the humble right at the beginning. You're going to be aware of them. You might have them on your kitchen wall. He said... Uh, at verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, every one of those statements is connected to humility. None of the people that Jesus is talking about see themselves as big shots see themselves as who the story is about. Am I the star of my day? It got quiet again. Is this my story? Or is it 
God's story and I'm a player in it. Now, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, but I think most of the time, most of us think we're the lead character here. This is a story about me and God's in it. And this is a story about the love of God and I'm in it. And I have to keep reminding myself of that because every time I move away from the realization that this is a story about the love of God and I'm in it, I begin to move into that place of pride where I'm being resisted instead of that place of humility where grace is being poured out on me. One of the great enemies of humility is an entitlement mentality, an entitlement attitude. And I heard somebody say it this way, a few months ago, I wrote it down because it just really spoke to me. But they said, concerning an entitlement attitude, if you are feeling cheated, then you are feeling deserving. Did you get that? If you're feeling cheated, then you're feeling deserving. And he went on to say, and that leads to self-pity. But beyond that, that's an entitlement attitude speaking. That says, I should be getting something other than what I'm getting if I feel cheated. Now that doesn't mean that there isn't anything that could be done that would be wrong or inappropriate, but you understand, when I feel cheated, that suggests that I believe I deserve something. And that's the opposite of the humility we're talking about. That's that arrogance trying to show itself and say, how dare you say that to me? I still here? Yes. That thing in me that wants to stand up and say, you can't treat me like that. You can't talk to me that way. You can't look at me that way. You can't do that. Well, maybe yes, you can. But we need to, oh, good night. Let's go back to 1 Peter. In <coughs> A little, in a few minutes, we're, we're going to come to the Lord's table together. And the attitude that I'm going to come in is that of humility. Not just generic humility because it's a good idea, but to actually take the moment to see myself small because the cross makes me small. It's an amazing thing that the love of God is so great that Jesus will go to the cross for me but the power of the cross is so much greater. The, the realization, there is a humbling that takes place every time I face the cross because it demands of me the realization that I failed and fell short and couldn't fix it. Nothing I could do was going to go back and make that right. And I don't know how you feel about those things. That... There's, there's a little piece of me that doesn't like to hear that I've ever messed anything up I can't fix. There's this little piece of me that says, I can make it, I can, I, I, I can, I. And it's like, no, he. The cross isn't about I, it's about him. The cross isn't about what I can do or should do or would do or could do or might do. It's about what he's done. And the forgiveness I receive isn't because I deserve it, and it isn't because I've earned it, and it isn't because I repent hard enough, or because I repent well enough, or accurately enough. The forgiveness I receive is because of what he's done, and because of who he is. And that's a humbling realization every time we come to it, that I can do nothing to deserve this gift. And I can try to live a life which corresponds to and represents the gift, but I can never live a life that deserves the gift. That's humbling. It'll just beat the arrogance right out of you if you will walk in that revelation. It puts us in a place of having to face the realization that I'm not as cool as I would like you to think I am.
In 1 Peter chapter 5, he says, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And then, there's verse 6, the therefore comes as a third word in the King James Version. But therefore, on account of that, since we realize that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. And I again want to say, his resistance isn't just to those who wear their arrogance on their sleeve so that everyone can see it. He resists every bit of us saying, I am can do this. I am capable of this. I am, no wonder God loves me. I'm cute, I'm smart, I'm lovable. Every piece of me that wants to deserve something is a piece which he resists. And when I in humility, throw myself as there's so many stories in the Gospels of people who just come to Jesus in absolute desperation. And they're beyond the point of trying to impress him. I mean, there's stories of people who come trying to impress him, trying to ask him sophisticated questions, trying to be cool about their need. But there are stories in there of people who just come and they've got no game. They're not saying, you know... Perhaps you'd like to come to my house. We have some interesting people there you might uh, find uh, yourself praying for. No, they're just saying, help me. Help me, please. Please, even the dogs get the crumbs. Is there nothing you can do? And that's where we see that, that anointing that Isaiah 61 speaks of, that, that Jesus reads aloud in Luke chapter chapter 4, where, where we, we recognize that the Spirit of the Lord upon him is answering that humility in us. In fact, let's, let's read in Luke chapter 4. I want to read that right now. I'm coming back to 1 Peter 5. Don't lose track of it. But in, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus said at verse 18, he's reading from Isaiah 61. What, you know, the context here is that he's in the synagogue, he's taken the scroll, he's opened it to the prophet Isaiah, and he's reading what in your Bible would be Isaiah chapter 61, beginning of verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he says at verse 18, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. You notice there is no proclamation for the cool. There is no proclamation for the self-righteous. There is no proclamation for the needless. When Jesus is commending blessings in Matthew 5, there's no blessing for those who've got it all together. Now, of course, there are none who've got it all together, but there are those who think they've got it all together. There are none who are cool, but there are those who think they're cool. There are none who have manufactured any righteousness of their own, but there are those who think they're full of self-righteousness. And though we might be quick to point our fingers and say, yeah, and those folks need to learn about Jesus like I've learned about Jesus and sing the songs that I sing, every time I point my finger, I got three of them pointing at me. And I'm the one who needs to be reminded more than anybody I know that it's all about Jesus. Because as I said, there's this piece of me that wants to make it about John all the time. This is John's story and Jesus is in it. No, this is Jesus' story and John is in it. The book begins with God before there was John. The book ends with God. I show up in the middle of the story. I'm not the hero of this story. I'm glad I get to be in it. Let's go back to, to 1 Peter chapter 5. Are you still with me? So there's a therefore. I was trying to work with the therefore in verse 6. Therefore, because of the realization that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble, and grace is my, my lifeline. Grace is what I need. I didn't need grace once. I need grace every day. I need his ability. I need his blessing. I need his favor. I need his presence. I need his face. I need his wisdom. I need his leading. I need his voice. I need him. And that's all grace. And that's an all-day, everyday thing. That isn't a sometimes when I get into a particularly sticky spot or on those occasions when the, the, everything is just perfect and I, I find myself 
in him. No, it's, it's all day, every day. And the less I feel like that, the more I need him and his grace. On account of that, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And humble yourselves. There are exactly two choices available here. You may humble yourself or you will be humbled. And that's all the options there are. You may humble yourself or you will be humbled. And I've been humbled by circumstances and situations. I prefer humbling myself. I realize that that's kind of a selfish and slightly cowardly thought, but I will admit it here before you. I prefer humbling myself. It is painful when I am humbled. When I was a little guy, I was squeamish about pain. And things like taking off band-aids with the hair on your arm stuck in them were an issue to me. I see none of you have had this challenge. That's My deal from the time I was old enough to push back a little bit was let me do it. Because if it's going to hurt me, I will be the one to hurt me, and I know when to stop. My mom was cool with that for about this long, but then she'd, be, she'd watch me working at the Band-Aid, trying to preserve every single hair, and she'd say, here, let me. <laughs> and there's all my hair on the Band-Aid. I've forgiven her. <laughs> but that was not one of my favorite things. This is not a fond memory from childhood. It just let me. <laughs> if it's going to hurt, let me do it. Get a sliver out, let me. I'll get that for you, Johnny. No, thank you. you I will run to the other end of the house and cry, but uh, but somehow or another as adults, a lot of us have this idea that, that somehow or another I can avoid humbling myself. And we will be humbled. It's coming. And when I recognize that, and I know how difficult and how painful having humbling come upon you is, it moves me to want to humble myself. And where we're to humble ourselves is under the mighty hand of God. That's the place where it counts. It's not important that everybody you know is impressed with how humble you are. It's not important that the rest of us think that you're humble. It's important that it be under God's hand that we are humble. And there's a purpose to that, that he may exalt you in due time. God has a plan to see you lifted up, but there's a right time for that. There's a due season for that. There's a moment for that. And getting there early is not a good option. Whatever exalting is going to take place has to happen in him, in his timing. Is this coming through? Now listen, verse 7, which is frequently just plucked right out of here, and that's okay, it works out of its context. It's not that we lose its meaning when we take it out of context, but it is in this context that he says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. The anxiety, the worry, the care can go on him because that's the question. If I don't exalt me, who will? If I don't push to get me to the front of the line, I won't end up at the front of the line. If I don't stand up to be noticed, I won't be noticed. If I humble myself, I may just drift off into obscurity. That's hard. He says, cast your cares on him. Let him carry the anxiety, the worry of, will I eat? Will I be clothed? Will I, will I be housed? Will I be fed? What will happen to me if I don't promote myself? If I don't put myself forward? What's to become of me if I don't make myself great? 
Jesus, Jesus will carry that. The anxiety, the, the concern rides on him. Roll your cares on him, for he cares for you. It matters to him concerning you. And we're not done there. He presses on beyond that. He says, be sober, be vigilant. The realization that God resists the proud and every little bit of arrogance that shows itself in me will be resisted should drive me to sobriety, to holding myself in a clear frame of mind, to keeping myself from the, the various intoxicants that so want to distract and disable me in this world. And be vigilant, which means on the one hand, I'm, I'm alert and focused, and on the other hand, I stay that way. Vigilance means that I'm not taking half the day off every day. Vigilance means that I'm on this 24-7. You still glad you came? Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. That's just the problem. There's a lion out there. You know, Proverbs has something to say about people who think there's a lion in, there's a, there's a lion in the streets. But that's not the problem. Whom resists steadfast in the faith. You've got what it takes to resist because of what God has done. I can't do all things, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I'm not a temple, but I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit of the living God. Are we here? Yes, I have an adversary who's looking for who will make themselves available for devouring, but I can stand up by the Spirit of God and say, no eating here. Not available. Off the menu. This boy is not an option today. Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish strength, and settle you. Let me, let me switch to the amplified version of the Bible briefly and read you that. You know, in Philippians chapter 2, it exhorts us to have the same mind in us that's in Christ Jesus, to receive that same attitude of humility. Now, let's walk through that for a moment. I haven't got anything to be proud of, but Jesus has that opportunity, doesn't he? I mean, he, he's got some stuff going on that he could get himself a little puffed up about, but it says that he humbled himself, submitted himself, offered himself a servant even to the point of death, and that's why he's exalted and why he has a name which is above every name. Have this same mind in you which is in Christ Jesus. Is that coming through? Here's the amplified version of, uh, I'm going to begin reading at verse 6 here. He says, Therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God, that in due time... He may exalt you, casting the whole of your care, all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, on Him. For He cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times, for that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. Withstand him. Be firm in faith against his onset, rooted, established, strong, immovable, and determined knowing that the same identical sufferings are appointed to your brotherhood, the whole body of Christians throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts all blessing and favor, who has called you to his own eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself complete and make you what you ought to be, establish and ground you securely, and strengthen and settle you. Is that good news? Yes. And that brings us to the, the last line, verse 11. To him be the dominion, power, authority, rule, 
forever and ever. Amen. So be it. It's such a simple thing to say, avoid pride, humble yourself. It's such a difficult thing to do. And it's something that we keep re-entering because it isn't done once. All day, every day, we are tempted with opportunities to pride. To an entitlement mentality that says that, that I deserved other, better, different. To an arrogance which wants to be more noticed, more appreciated, more, just more. It isn't enough, I need more. And we have to keep choosing humility. The, the best part of this story is that it isn't my strength that I choose the humility in but I'm strengthened with might in my innermost being by the Holy Spirit of the living God to choose humility, to humble myself. If this was about me being emotionally strong enough to just keep myself humble, I think we'd be losing here. But if it's about his ability to keep working in me, to keep me humble and to keep me humbling myself, then then there is no limit to how long I can go on in this position of humility, humbled under his mighty hand. Is that an amen? Let's stand up together, if you will. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, it says at the 9th verse, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The first heavy dose of humility for us in this walk with God is the realization that I have sinned and come short of his glory and that I'm in need of a savior. And that was, you know, we talk about repentance, a change. There was a change in me. I was convinced that I was as good as anybody I, well, not as good as anybody, as good as most everybody I knew and certainly better than most. And my whole experience in life was that if you are ahead of the fat part of the bell curve, you're all right. That if you just stay out ahead of the bump, you're gonna make it. And I thought, well, that's where I am with God. I'm ahead of the bump. The world is full of people worse than me. And so I may not be proud of my score, but I'm sure it's enough to pass because there's so many behind me. I didn't need a savior because I was riding the front end of the bell curve. And in a moment, that changed. I was broken from my pride. And I realized it was, it was as if, spiritually speaking, my eyes had been opened for the first time. I saw the sin and the failure and my complete inability to do anything about it, to in some way reconcile it or rescue myself from it. And in that moment, I understood that this Jesus that I was hearing about was the savior that I needed. And that what he had done was what I needed in my life. And that's what this, this ninth verse of the 10th chapter of Romans is speaking to. That's when we realize in our hearts that God the Father has overridden the judgment of men. Men said, crucify him, bury him, forget about him. God said, he will rise. Every time we mention the resurrection of Jesus, we testify to the judgment of God superseding the judgment of men. Realizing in my heart that that is the truth, that God the Father raised Jesus from the dead and that he sits, he's seated at the right hand of majesty, alive today. And then I make a confession with my mouth and I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
We've seen it on keychains and bumper stickers and refrigerator magnets, and it comes to be a phrase that we're familiar with, but it's a declaration. Jesus is in fact the Christ, the promised Messiah and the prophesied one, and he is Lord. He takes the place of whatever has ruled. He, Caesar is not my Lord. This world system is not my Lord. I'm not on that throne in my life, but Jesus Christ is. And in that simple declaration, I acknowledge that Jesus is who he says he is, does what he says he does, and that I am humbling myself before him. I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to pray that way. I'm going to invite you to join me in it if you'd like to. Either as a testimony of how much you celebrate having done this, or if you haven't done it before and you're, you're feeling pricked in your heart, doing it for the first time today. Let's take a moment and pray. Dear God, I thank you for hearing my cry. I come to you in the name of Jesus, believing in my heart that you've raised him from the dead. What an amazing thought. And testifying with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you, Father, for this precious new life, for this astounding grace, for receiving me to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen.